Hello everybody, I'm the host Donatos Rubanas and I want to present you our newest guest is the scoring machine from Partizan Belgrade, Kevin Panther. Thanks for joining the show. Thank you, man. Appreciate you. Thank you for having me. Kevin, for the warm-up, uh, I want to ask you, what's your inspiration behind your beard game? <laughs> Because I have a feeling that it might be up to someone. Uh, to be honest with you, it's not specifically someone. Okay. Uh, I started growing it in college and I just, I didn't have no other facial hair. So I just started growing it and it started getting longer and longer and longer. And I was, I just left it. I was like, it's going to be kind of like, this is what I do. You know what I'm saying? And then as I got older, Kevin Durant was kind of doing mm -hmm. the same. So I just left for, for what it was. So I really didn't have no facial hair. So it's the only thing I could grow. So I just like, I'm going to keep doing this because I got no other hair. So I'm gonna just keep doing this. Yeah. And because, you know, I'm asking because watching you play, mm -hmm. you, you have, you know, some like similarities, yeah. uh, the way you play, the way you scored the ball, like Kevin Durant. Mm -hmm. the kind that's of all I watched thing. growing up. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day. That's the only person I watched really growing up. Obviously, with Kobe's and stuff like that, but in terms of like emulating my game after, because, you know, he's skinny, I'm skinny, and he get a shot up, and just little things like that. So I'm like, I'm gonna just keep watching him. And that's all I, I used to watch him a lot growing up when he was at Texas, and then on like, up until now, so. Yeah, and I'm, I'm talking about your scoring. I mean, it's these are crazy numbers. For mm -hmm. example, your first EuroLeague Final Four experience, 23 points in the semifinal game against the top defense in the EuroLeague. Yeah. For example, uh, FIBA Champions League Final against Tenerife in mm -hmm. 2019, 26, yeah. if I'm right, yeah. And then with uh, Championship with Ajax, FIBA Champions League Final, 60 points, 16 points uh, again. Um, I was trying to figure out uh, what's behind your, you know, Clutchness behind your scoring. Mm -hmm. How did you build up that kind of uh, game? Uh, just, I just had a knack for it at a young age. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to explain, but I mean, I don't, I don't know. I just I watched a lot of basketball. Uh, I love basketball, I still do. And I just kind of, you know, when you skinny growing up, you just gotta. I mean, when you a kid, you gotta figure out different ways to score. I've always found ways to. I mean, obviously, I never scored like how I scored now when I was a little kid, but I always just found ways to end up scoring, whether it's a layup ball time or anything. I always just throw the way, just just figuring out the game and just, you know, growing and watching a lot of film and seeing different ways how I could score and just a bunch of stuff, to be honest with you. So, you know, that's that's about it, really. So, as you mentioned, KD was kind of your role model? You mean the guy yeah, you yeah, I watched him a lot. Oh. I watched him a lot. Uh, I'll say a quick funny story. So when I was before I got to college, probably my maybe sophomore year in high school, I was playing AAU basketball. I don't, not too many people know what AAU basketball is, but it's like in the summertime we travel with a team and mm -hmm. y'all go from tournament to tournament. But long story short, my coach always told me if you dribble. So what was happening was I was dribbling, let's say, more than three, four times, and I was finding myself in trouble, like either mm -hmm. turn the ball over. Uh, just doing something stupid. So I start to notice every time I dribble maybe under three times and just shoot, I was I would score like a pull-up. So that's how I started to even learn how to pull up, like shoot the pull-up jump shot. And my dad used to always tell me nobody could guard a pull-up because everybody want to shoot threes and get all the way to the basket. So if you stop on a dime, like you're not going to know when the person's going to shoot, and that's the hardest thing to guard. So as a little kid, I used to just just – Go real hard, two dribbles, one dribble, and just stop mm -hmm. and just shoot, whether I miss or not. Like, and just and I've done that for years, and now I start to master, like just going right, going left, stopping on the dime, one, two, three, four dribbles. It doesn't even matter how many dribbles now, but I've been doing that as since a little kid. But I wasn't as good as it, obviously. But my dad used to always just say the pull up jumper, the pull up jumper, and then just kind of practicing, just messing around, and just I kept doing it over and over and over. And I started to learn like. No one could really stop that. If you really go full speed and stop, you can't stop it. So that's kind of how I developed that up until now. But nobody really know that. I don't really, you know, share that. A lot of people would like to, you know, say, yeah, but but I'm so serious. Like, I really, you know what I'm saying? So that's a little quick story. Who was your toughest defensive challenge? In my life or? At which you faced? Um, 
I don't really be having a lot of people, to be honest with you. Uh, I'll probably say two people. No, I'll probably say Kelvin Martin. He he played with um who he played for last year. Uh, how did I forget who he played for last year? He played at, my old teammate at Virtus. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Was probably the hardest or the, the hardest uh, defender I've ever went against in my life. To be honest with you, that's it. I don't really. Yeah, that's it. To be honest with you. And since you are recognized as one of the elite scorers uh, we have in Europe, who 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 else you would you know add to that list? As when you watch your league or the Euro Cup basketball right now, who do you consider you know these elite scorers, pure scorers? Pure, pure scorers, uh, just straight pure scorers. It's a good question in Europe right now. Uh, Probably Mike James was on that list, right? Yeah, he's definitely on that list, 100% that I've played against. Um, yeah, you could say Mike. What it's like to play against a scorer, either Mike James or whatever? I like it. I place. love it. I love it, to be honest with you. Not to get into a one-on-one battle, but uh-huh. like that's like in my blood to score the ball. So when I see another player that – and I can identify – Pure scores because that's what really what I am. So when I play against that, I love it because it's just like it's fun. Number one, and you and the other player get to really go at it. Not in a one-on-one battle, but within whatever system y'all run, y'all get to do y'all thing. You know what I'm saying? So like when we played Cheska last year, you know what I'm saying? I had like 32, but I played the way I played and got it. And you know Mike had a game and he he played the way he got. You know what I'm saying? So. Just using that as an example, that was just, that was fun. You had many fun games last season and uh, you reached your first yearly Final Four. And I want to bring you back, you know, to these uh, clutch moments. I remember you made very, very tough three-pointer, uh, yeah. which tied the game 82-82 against Barcelona. Then with like 10 seconds left, it was a really great set by Ettore Messina. You kind of had a good look. It seemed like that Nikola Mirotic, you know, no, I had a uh, great look. jumped you over, right. and it seemed like it was a good shot, right? What do yeah. you remember about that situation? I remember Malcolm had the ball on the left hand side of the court. I think they iced him. Um, he did no, they didn't ice him. He used the screen and he kicked it out to me. And all I remember was catching it and ready to shoot. But uh, oh man, I, it hurts me even talking about it sometimes. I got it uh a pump, put the ball down first because obviously he jumped because yeah. I've been hitting it. So he jumped. I work in the I work on the shot. I, I can't eat even like a million times. Like just and he jumps. I go right through and I shot like any other shot. And it just it did not it didn't it said not today. Like I'm not going in tonight. Like, you know, and that's that's all I remember. And then the game went by so fast, and next you know, they was hitting another shot on the other end. But the shot felt good. Nothing was off, you know, but I was shoot that shot many times. So, How do you deal with such situ- situations? How do you deal with what? I mean, how do you deal when you miss? Mm-hmm. I- I'm not sure how many, you know, important shots you've missed yeah, before yeah, in your yeah. career. But how do you deal? What's the next morning for you? Uh, do you suffer? No, or it's like not just really. The other day and I that's don't. It. And one reason, the only thing that keeps me at ease is is knowing I work so hard on that. And in, and in general, it's like I can't ever sit there and look in the mirror and really suffer or, or beat myself up. Yeah, I beat myself up because you want to make the shot, but... I always try to put things in perspective. You know what I'm saying? If you do something a million times over and over and over and over, and you've had a lot of success, but then the one time in a crucial moment you miss it, I mean, yeah, I'm going to be upset in the moment, but, you know, you created a, a foundation and a routine of of doing that habit and making it over. No, you can't be, you can't even manage yourself. You can't, you really, really can't, you know? So that's why in the moment, I was like, obviously in the moment I was upset, but, just, you know, I try to put things in perspective and really think about it. You know, it's a shot I shoot all the time. Nothing happened. If I would have made it, then, you know, I would have made it. But I missed it, and that was that. Did you ever think about how that shot would have changed things? Yeah. For example, EuroLeague Finals. 
Mm. Maybe even your future in Milano? Um, that's a really good question, man. Um, possibly, man. I just know if, if I hit that shot, we in the finals and we play against who Ephes. Yeah. And I think we what, beat them twice in the regular season. Uh, you know, I like my chances. We all know it's gonna be a good game, but you know, we in Euro League finals. So that's that's it's one game right there. So you put yourself in a position to win one game, you know? So I've thought about it a lot, even after weeks after after that, uh after the final four things of that nature. But I mean you can't really I try not to really uh think about it too too much. Here and there I may think about it, you know, but that's mm. about it. What was your plan for the free agency? Uh, mm. Before Partisan Project, for example, because it came kind of out of nowhere, you know? Mm. What was your, you know, first idea what you're gonna do with your career? Man, um <laughs> my first idea what I was gonna do was I'm be honest, I thought I, I, I thought I was going back, to be honest with you. Like I thought I was going back, but um that's just the business of basketball. It happens, things happen, and that's that's it to be that's it to be honest with you. I was told by some people that at least from Milano area they think that you might have been upset. Uh, were you upset in a way that maybe Milano could have matched the offer? Maybe you expected them to match the offer of a Partizan? Um, nah. Uh, Partizan and Milan, they didn't, they didn't have nothing to do with one another. Um, we was in negotiations with uh, Milano before Partizan came in and You know, like I said, the business of basketball took over and, and that's really, and that was that, to be honest with you. And that conversation with uh, Jelko uh, Obradovic, was also, is it true that it was kind of, you know, five or ten minute conversation or it was longer? No, yeah, we, me and him spoke over the phone. Me and him spoke over uh -huh. the phone about some, about some good things uh, during, during, the, during that process, during those times. But me and him spoke over the phone probably about maybe two, three times. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, me and spoke on the phone. What was his main pitch? Uh, he likes challenges. Obviously, he's coming back to coach, but he likes challenges and he want to go. He want to go hard. He want to work hard. So automatically, my life is full of challenges since I was a little kid. So automatically, I, I was thumbs up to that. Uh, you know, so it was easy for me to. You know, come play for him. Obviously, you know we want to get back to year league. We want to, you know, what I'm saying. So that was also another like, you know, uh, gives you more motivation to, uh, you know, try to do something special. So it wasn't in the beginning. It was kind of a little like I don't know, but after after a while, I thought about it, and uh, it was it was it was a good decision. It was an easy decision for me to make. But you, I think that uh, you were the first big signing uh, mm. for Partizan. Was it, you know, a bit, uh, let's say, was it hard to believe the project of Partizan? Because sometimes you, you, you can never know what might happen, what kind of players they might yeah. sign. Not really. Um, I knew with a coach like Brodovic, he was, we was going to be all right. You know what I'm saying? With me and with me being the first player, hopefully it helped. And which it did other players to come and, and obviously see what's going on and want to be a part of the team, you know. So um, it wasn't. Once he took the job, I knew uh, they was going to do some, some some pretty good things over there. Jelko Bradovic is considered, considered probably as the best coach in Europe. And it's probably a good feeling to be, you know, uh, the first signing of the best coach uh, in Europe. Mm -hmm. But back in, back in the day, uh, when you played in, in Greece and in Belgium and Poland, it was the situation that probably, you, you know, you couldn't choose between, for example, Partizan yeah. and Milan and the, the best teams. <laughs> and your yeah. first deal with Lavrio, it was like $45,000 of 40. 40, okay. What do you remember the most about, about that situation where you had to start everything from zero here in Europe, you know, to build your name? Yeah, um, man, I almost, I didn't have a passport probably two weeks before I had to leave. 
That's how much I knew about Europe. I didn't have a passport. Um, man, that 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 was a reality check in a way. Um, you know, you dream of playing the NBA, you don't play in the NBA, now you gotta go to overseas and things like that. Um in the beginning I didn't really embrace it. Um, you know, I struggled a lot just off the court, you know. Um just trying to find myself, find my way. Basketball really kept me at ease and things of that nature, but just off the court, it was it was tough, man. Like, I couldn't really I almost went home in like December. A lot of people don't know that. I I was talking to my agent and I'm just like, man, like I'm like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. But um What's so hard about that overseas experience? Because probably it's not just you, yeah, you know, no, dealing for with sure. these struggles. Um when you've never been over when you've never been out of the out of America, uh it could be a lot, just the culture change and the food and the way of living, the style. It was completely different than what I'm used to, than what Americans are used to. So even now, like I'm used to it now, but now I know how to deal with certain things of that nature. So I can only imagine someone that's never, ever been in an environment like this, what they can go through. But for me, it was just like the time change, the culture change, the food. Like the smell was different. Like just everything was like the language is just like, and it's right at you. Like you know what I'm saying? Oh, you I don't got to go to Europe. And then a week later, it's like oh, you got to go to Europe. So it was like, mentally, it's like, well, am I even ready for this? So it was like it was it was all of that. Just adjusting with the style of play, um, understanding that the defense, like it was just weird. Like it was just. The style of basketball was weird to me in my rookie year. I'm like, why do you do this? Why do you make fouls on a fast break? Mm. You know how people used to just make fouls? Like, why? Like, I used to hate that. <laughs> now, I look to do it every chance I get. Because now you start to understand the game and why they do it. But my first year, I'm like, I thought it was the stupidest thing ever. Because in the States, they don't do that. Mm -hmm. In the NBA, college NBA, they do not yeah. do any of that. And growing up, that's what we watch as Americans. So you get to Europe and you do that. It's like, yeah, bugging. You don't do that. But you start to understand why you do it. So, like, oh, that's really smart. You guys are out number, they about to score. If you can make a, a realistic foul, stop the whole break, no two point. And you got fouls to use. I started to understand how to use fouls when I came to Europe. Don't understand how to use fouls. Most Americans coming to Europe don't understand how to use fouls. They probably won't tell you that, but I'll tell you, because that's the truth. Like, and I love basketball, I did not know how to use fouls. So to understand how to use fouls and when to use it, like little things like that, like I learned in Europe. So now, like my first couple of years going back home to the States playing in NBA camps, it was easier. Now the court is bigger. Mm. So now in my head, I'm thinking like, okay, like Europe really like, okay. Man. So that's when it started to make sense. And I started to embrace it more. And then from there, I just kind of just like figured things out by myself. I learned myself a lot. It kind of just went from there. You mentioned that you... You, f you were thinking, you were considering, you know, coming back home in December. Do you remember what was the turning point which, like, boosted your experience in Europe that you decided, you know, just to go through yeah, it? Yeah, I remember exactly. The checks. I was getting 5000 a month and I was broke. So I couldn't go home. If I go home, like, well, like, what am I going to do? Let's say if I go G League, it's going to be less than this. Let's just hypothetically think, like... So what? So you went from a situation you thought was the worst in the world to now something less than what you even get. So number one, be grateful. And then two, it's not as always, it's not as bad as you always think. You know, other people are going to do worse. So every month, getting paid every month honestly helped me a lot because it was my first time like getting any kind of like real money. You know, it wasn't a lot, but I was grateful for it. And that kept me going hard every day and, you know, looking forward to something. As a young kid growing up, not really, that didn't have no money. You know what I'm saying? So that, honestly, that what kept me going. And then I wanted to be great too. And I love basketball. So I'm like, I'm just, anytime I went to the gym and worked out, I didn't think about nothing else in the world. I was at ease playing basketball. So that helped me. My, my rookie year. Then I played for a great coach my rookie year that actually, he he allowed me to beat me on the court. You know what I'm saying? So that helped a lot, tremendously. For pure scorers, it's really not easy in Europe because yeah. European basketball is different. Yeah. And there's kind of the approach that if you score a ball a lot, 
sometimes you, you know, might be considered as a selfish player, your mm-hmm. teammates might be unhappy. And I remember I was listening to your podcast and you, you told that I always prefer, you know, to make that bucket, you know, because I maybe I trust myself more than, more. you know, just passing the yeah. ball for somebody else because I really believe that I can make that shot. But it's not easy to make your teammates happy, you know, that kind of approach. What do you remember the most about that kind of adjustment, you know, yeah. how to find that balance being, you know, scorer mm-hmm. at the same time kind of team friendly scorer yeah um pick uh, you, i feel like I, i'll tell anybody is you have to learn how to really really pick your spots and this good and this goes back to watching kevin durant so much if you watch he's a pure scorer but if you watch a lot of his shots a lot of them is real efficient he doesn't take 50 million dribbles like when he was a go to state yeah he played iso ball but a lot of his stuff was down pick simple things one two pull up like just real simple and to the point so I always in any offense that I'm in, I tell I, I always I always know I can score in any different way on a basketball court. We just I just have to see what kind of system that we that we're in. So I feel like for me, anything is gonna work. So if we're in, let's say a, a up and down system, cool. I know how to run the floor, pick whatever. If we in a half court, I know how to pick my spots in a half court and get to where I need to get to. So that I feel like I un, I start to understand that more. And then become more efficient and where majority of my spots come from as a professional. And then I understand that it's harder to guard me if I increase my range. So now you have to come out even further to guard me because if you don't, I can hit it from about 40. But now if you come all the way out there, I can drive. So I started to kind of learn and just pick up on little things like that and kind of figure out how to play my game within what we're trying to do also. And then obviously just the ISO ball is that's always going to be me, you know, and coaches, thank God, you know, allow me to, to, to uh, be me in terms of, you know, playing ISO, you know, at the right opportunities and sometimes not even the right opportunity, but you know, you make the shot and you know, it is what it is, you know? So, yeah. Talking about these coaches, you played for many great coaches like Messina, Djordjevic, uh, Shakata, uh, for example. How they were trying to help you to be, you know, as efficient scorer as yeah. you can? Uh, they all put me in really good uh, situations to, to to score the ball. Uh, I just had to do my job. Uh, one one thing all of those coaches have in common is uh, they always wanted me to be aggressive. Uh, not even to score, but just, men- you know, mentally have an aggressive mentality, you know, uh, Always be in attack mode. So that's the one thing they all have in common. They all allow me to, to do that. Um, and that, that was that. Coach Hakota was probably the one who took you to a higher level. Uh, Ajax, Athens team, you won the FIBA Champions uh, League together. Then again, later, he took you from Olympiakos after, you know, that bad mm-hmm. experience. And again, you kind of, you know, regain your confidence in, in Red Star in the EuroLeague. Did, did you, and I, I remember that when he already had you in Athens, he was telling people around that, hey, I believe that that guy might be special on the EuroLeague stage, even mm-hmm. though you were playing at FIBA Champions League. Did you have any kind of special relationship with him? What what kind of experiences? Uh, yeah, me and him have a really, really good relationship till to this day. Till to this day. Uh, he brought me to Ike and, you know, I'm real good friends with his son, Dusan. Mm-hmm. So I, obviously I played with him at Ike and, you know, me and Dusan still talk today if, if need be. But um, you know that's that's really it. You know that's he brought me to Ike, and then we you know we win the championship. Uh, win two actually, we beat Olympiacos in the cup, and then he brought me to Red Star from Olympiacos, and that kind of you know rejuvenated me and got my confidence back. You know, so those are two pivotal points in my career where he was there for both of them. So our relationship is forever. Uh, is forever there. You know, uh, I could always pick up the phone and call him by anything just to talk, have a regular conversation. So, uh, yes, I'm blessed for, you know, blessed for 100%. Um, to finish our conversation, you're starting a new, very intriguing chapter, as we, we as we talked before, very challenging uh, chapter. It's a whole new project, whole new team. But what kind of impression uh, did you have, you know, watching the team from the sidelines and later joining joining mm-hmm. your team in, in the practices? Yeah. Uh, Good man, we go hard. I say that much. Like we, I just we go hard. I can't wait. 
Uh, obviously, tomorrow is my first official game, so I'll, I'll have a different feel of everything. But in terms of just being in practice and just going over plays, playing each other in practice, it's, it's, it's going to be a fun year for us. I'll say that. Uh, I'm just excited to play my first official game with the team tomorrow and just have fun. You know, uh, everybody's ready to work. Everybody's, you know, want to be great and win. So everyone's on the same page. So, you know, I can't wait. You made the headlines in Serbia as the highest paid uh, player in Serbia uh, mm-hmm. ever. And is it something? Is it nothing for you? Is it kind of, you know, establishing your status or, you know, having that uh, chip on your, on your shoulder? That chip on my shoulder is never going to go away. It's never going to go away. It's impossible. I just from where I come from and things I had to do to get here, it's just, it's forever there. So I got a chip on my shoulder this year like no other. So... I guess I'm just ready to work, you know, have fun, and just, just try to do something cool. I remember you had an interesting question, probably it was a podcast, Vision Culture, something like that. Swiss Cultures, yeah, 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 yeah. And the question was win or bust, and you didn't have clear answer uh, back then. But I was trying to think that probably a lot of people, a lot of fans, basketball community will probably you know, uh, will value it as a, as a win or bust for Partizan. Mm-hmm. But I was just trying to figure out uh, how Želko Bradovic is trying to get you ready for that kind of uh, challenging, having a whole new team and how, how's, how he's uh, helping you guys to go through it. Yeah. Um, he's helping us a lot, to be honest with you. I feel like a lot of that stuff has to come from the players. You know what I'm saying? Our coach could... could could tell you whatever, you know, I mean, he could tell you, you know, but as players, you got to want to, you know, be great also, you know, a coach, cause he's not out there playing. So yeah, coach helps tremendously, but I feel like with coach helping, all the players got to help each other too, you know what I'm saying? To make it a group thing and not just a coach thing, you know what I'm saying? So I feel like that's the, uh, that's the big thing too. So we all know coach is going to be a great teacher. He's going to show you how to play, teach you how to play, and things of that nature, put you in position, be great. But, you know, players, we got to just, on top of that, come together, get better every day, come to work every day, and just and just build. And, you know, we do that, we'll, we'll be fine. That was Kevin Punter, folks. Thanks a lot for sharing your experience. Thank you, man. Appreciate you. Thank you for having me. I can remember you that you can follow us on basketnews.com as well as Basket News YouTube channel and all the main audio platforms.